Hi, thanks for checking out today's message from Calvary Baptist Church in Lake Havasu City, Arizona. We are in week 10 of our Fruitful Living sermon series based on the book of Galatians. Today's message is about love, the first fruit of the Spirit. We are looking at chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The Life Notes are available now to download from calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here's Pastor Chad Garrison. Take a seat, uh, grab your Bible or your Bible app, and turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 is our text. And if you are in the room and you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. We'd encourage that. But if you don't have a Bible, uh, grab one of the Bibles on the seats around you there, and then turn to page 1,158. That's 1158. You'll be able to follow along in Galatians chapter 5 and see what we're talking about. And if you want a Bible and you don't have one, take one with you. It's our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word, read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then message us, uh, service host, or email us at calvaryaz.com. We will get you a Bible because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, have you guys noticed that summer is here? Yeah, I mean, it's getting, it's getting a little bit warm, you know, just a little bit. It hasn't gotten hot yet, but it's gotten warm. Hey, uh, kids in the room, you guys enjoying summer vacation? I mean, let me rephrase that. Kids in the room, are you enjoying summer vacation? See, no, they're not answering. They're like, I'm afraid to answer it because I don't want my parents to know what I'm thinking. Uh, teachers in the room, are you guys enjoying summer vacation? Yes. All right, see, they're, they're like, yeah, we're the, that's an easy answer. Parents, now it's your turn to answer. Are you enjoying summer vacation? They're, they're, they're like, uh, when school start? Uh. Hey, you know, pretty much all of us uh, either went to school or are in school, you know, in that process of moving toward graduation at some point in our lives, whether it was uh, in a public school, private school, home school, uh, charter school, some kind of school. You went to some kind of educational curriculum that you finished along the way, or you're in process. So how many people would say you love school? Let's see your hands. Not that many. Okay. How many people, uh, you know, really didn't love school? <laughs> A lot of hands go up. All right. So let's, let's play, play a little game here. What was your favorite subject and your least favorite subject in school? I don't want you to tell me. I want you to tell the person next to you, one of the people next to you. Okay, you have like 10 seconds. Favorite and least favorite subject. Recess and lunch do not count, okay? Okay, you guys aren't talking a whole lot. You gotta, 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 get, gotta, get those, gotta get those answers out there. All right, did you learn something about the people sitting near you? All right, favorite, least favorite subject. Hey, I did school for 22 years. Uh, so, you know, not just elementary. No, thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, I, that was a great, great question to ask. Uh, and it did include uh, bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees. But, uh, and I, I will confess, I never loved school. Love learning, but I never loved school. Uh, but the lo longer I went, the better I liked it. And uh, my favorite subject was history. And uh, I loved it at every level, American history, Western civilization, church history, the gospels. My least favorite subject of all that I took was Hebrew uh, because there was really no point. Uh, so it's just a required course I had to get, through, get out of the way. So, so why talk about school if many of us, most of us have graduated long, long ago? Well, we're continuing our Galatian study. I hope you realize that because I ask you to turn to the book of Galatians. But we're starting a nine-week deep dive on the fruit of the Spirit. So last week we talked about this, this whole contrast in the lifestyles. And, and if you walk in the Spirit, you will not you know, gratify the desires of the flesh. And so we're talking about each of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And they're listed in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And here's the challenge. I would love to challenge you over the next nine weeks to memorize Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The apostle says, for the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Okay, that's the, that's the list. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit listed in Galatians chapter 5. And the reason I want you to memorize this is because the fruit of the Spirit is required coursework. The fruit of the Spirit is required coursework. 
if you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to, de- to tell the world that Jesus is your Savior. You decided to follow Jesus. And by the way, that was so cool last Sunday. Uh, we had one on Sunday morning, so we had 75 baptisms last Sunday. Isn't that amazing? 75 people saying, hey, Jesus is my Savior. I, 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 we love that. And, and by the way, if you weren't there and you're like, oh, I missed it, we, we'll do it again. We'll do it for you, okay? So you just let us know. We'll, we'll plan it and, and celebrate it. But here's the thing. If you are a follower of Jesus, then God the Holy Spirit inhabits your life. The moment you confess Jesus as Lord, even before you got wet, God the Holy Spirit came into you, claimed you as property of Jesus. He guarantees your salvation. He guarantees heaven is your home. But he, you know, comforts you in your sorrow. He convicts you of sin. It's not my job. It's his. And he teaches us the truth. The Holy Spirit is the teacher of truth. So when, um, you know, afterwards, sometimes people say, wow, your sermon really spoke to me. What that means is that you are listening to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is taking the Word of God and He's applying it to your life. And it may be something I said. It may not have been something I said. It doesn't really matter because if you're listening to the Holy Spirit, He will teach you truth. He will convict you of sin. He, he will lead you into understanding the Word of God. So the Holy Spirit is the teacher and He is teaching all of us the character of Jesus. Now, if we want to represent Jesus, hey, do you guys want to represent Jesus well? Yes. Okay, if you want to represent Jesus, then we need to reflect his character, and that's what the fruit of the Holy Spirit summarizes. That's why I want you to know it. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Okay, that, that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach you. It's what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach me. It's what the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, I want you to look like Jesus in your life. So this is the character I want you to have. If you will, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 is your syllabus for the coursework that the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. Okay, if you're a follower of Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus yet, we want you to trust Jesus. We want you to follow Jesus. We want you to find forgiveness of sin. We want you to understand you have eternal life. We want you to trust God. Okay, that, that's, that's our desire. And, and that's why our mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And if you're thinking about it or you're not thinking about it, but you're here anyway, we still want you to listen and learn. But um, I'm just telling you, it, it's so much better when Jesus is your Savior. So, so this is our syllabus for our degree in following Jesus. And uh, by the way, that means that these are not electives. Okay. The reason I want you to memorize this, because this is the coursework that you're required to master as a follower of Jesus. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You're going to hear that a lot the next nine weeks, all right? So you might as well go ahead and accept the fact you're going to memorize it and get it down. I mean, you already learned that new song, you know, stuff. You're like, oh, I like that one. I got the words. So you can do this. By the way, since these are not electives, that means you can't opt out of one of them. Because some of you are like, hey, uh, I don't want to learn self-control. I don't really want to learn patience. So I'll just tell you one of my, my favorite pet peeves so you won't stumble into it and, and get the one-on-one lecture. I'll just do it as, to the group, okay? People in the church, I've heard this my whole life. When I was a kid, I was like, oh, okay. Now I'm like, no. Here's the, here's the thing. People go, oh, don't pray for patience. You ever heard someone tell you that? Don't pray for patience, because if you pray for patience, life's going to get really hard. Hey, guess what? Patience is one of the courses you're taking. The Holy Spirit doesn't care if you pray for patience or not. The Holy Spirit is still going to teach you patience. If you go, I don't want to learn patience, then guess what? You're a bad student. (laughs) Which means you get to take it again. (laughs) Right? I mean, because look, if... Here's the deal. You're going to listen to the Holy Spirit. You're going to learn the lessons. Or if you fail a grade in school, what are you going to do? Yeah, if you fail a required course in college, what are you going to do? Yeah, you guys aren't liking this, are you? See, if you fail Kindness 101 or Faithfulness 300, guess what you get to do? 
<laughs> Some of you are just realizing why your life seems like it's stuck in a cycle. <laughs> right now, you're like going, oh, is this why I'm having the same problems, encountering the same situations, the same issues? Yes, it is. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit is like, you have to learn this. And if you learn it, then guess what? You get to go to the next level, advance, and learn the harder lessons, but you'll have more wisdom and more peace along with that. So look, we're students. We might as well embrace it because some of us were not those students in school, right? A lot of you raised your hand confessing to that just a little while ago. Didn't love school, didn't want to learn, didn't pay attention, didn't turn in the homework, didn't do the stuff, Right? Now, a lot of you still succeeded in life in spite of that. Can I just tell you that being a successful Jesus follower, that's not going to work that way? Because submission is part of what we do. And it's part of saying, hey, uh, the Holy Spirit is my teacher, and I'm going to submit to what he's teaching me, and I'm going to say yes to it, and I'm going to learn that lesson. Because otherwise, we get to repeat that lesson. And repeat it again. And repeat it again. Until we accept it and we learn it, and we apply it to our lives. Uh, so the Holy Spirit is teaching us the character of Christ. We're the students, and, uh, and I want you just to know this. You already know this. The character of Jesus begins with love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the first one listed. First characteristic, love. Uh, it shouldn't surprise any of us, because if we're followers of Jesus, then we already know that Jesus gave us the great commandment. Right? You guys have heard of the great commandment? They're asking Jesus, which is the most important commandment. And Jesus says, uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and prophets depend on these two. It all is related to these two. So loving God with your entire being and loving people and, and, and understand, that, that's a great commandment. And then everything in the Bible is based on that. Everything else that we read, everything else that we learn, everything else that we apply is based on those two things. Loving God with everything that you are and loving your neighbor as yourself. If we do those things, then we are embracing the teaching of the Holy Spirit and modeling the character of Jesus that begins with love. In other words, if we're not loving we're not biblical. Let me say that again. If we're not loving, we're not biblical. I know a lot of people who will claim to be biblical because they know truth, but they're not loving people, so they're not living truth. They know the truth, but they're not living truth. You see, if we don't love, we don't represent Jesus. If we don't love, we don't represent Jesus. And, and I honestly don't know how we can miss this. I mean, it's so obvious if you just read the Bible, right? I mean, you read the Bible, it's like, it talks about loving a whole lot. And see, what's crazy is you can grow up in churches, I did, where this was taught, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself. Everybody knew it, but, it, but we didn't model it well. I mean, we emphasize the truth. Okay, you got to know the truth. got to know the truth. This is truth. This is truth. This is truth. And by the way, here at Calvary, we emphasize truth, right? Our very first core value is relatable truth. If we read and apply God's word, God will... Change your life. Yeah, God will change your life. Okay, we teach it. Why? Because it's true, but you got to... Notice what we say. So it's a little bit different. If you read and apply. <laughs> if you don't apply it, it doesn't do a bit of good to you. If you don't apply God's word, then you're like the idiot who built his house on sand and everything's going to fall down. Those are Jesus' words, not mine. Okay? Uh, so I'm just telling you, this, this is what the, the Bible tells us. This is what Jesus tells us. And so he's like, no, you've got to read it and apply it. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So, um, so we emphasize truth. I was taught to emphasize truth. But here's the thing. Truth without love is mean. Truth without love just becomes, comes across as nasty. I, I'm sure you have never personally encountered mean Christians, but I grew up with them. I grew up with people who, who knew the Word of God, but um, they weren't real nice. And a lot of them were leaders in the church. So uh, just to be clear, at Calvary, if you don't love well, we're not going to ask you to lead. 
We don't care how much you know. We don't care how holy your life looks to other people. If you don't love people well, we're not gonna put you in charge of people. Why? Because you're not representing Jesus if you don't love. I mean, it's where it starts, right? Love the Lord your God, thy heart, soul, mind, strength, love your neighbor as yourself. Everything depends on these two. Everything is dependent on this. So, uh, you know, for us, this is just non-negotiable. If you want to lead, you got to love. Because Jesus said so. John 13, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. You guys know the rest of this? If you love one another. He didn't say, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples. If you truth one another. By this, all men will know you're my disciples if you holy one another. He just said, look, it's about loving one another. That's where it becomes known that you are really my people. So if we don't love, we don't represent Jesus, no matter how righteous we may look, no matter how truthful we may be, because we're not applying the word of God, it doesn't connect. You see, if we try to represent Jesus without love, we confuse people about the gospel, and I think we drive them away from grace. And, and honestly, I think that's one of the key reasons why we've been losing ground in reaching people with the gospel. We cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And if we don't love, we don't represent Jesus. Now, see, most of us know that. I don't think I've shared anything that's probably shocked uh, very, few, very few people in this room uh, or joining us online. But, but let's get to the practical and the difficult part. Let's talk about love in practice. Love and practice. Uh, now, the reality is I could preach 52 sermons on love and we wouldn't cover everything. So I'm not going to try and do that in uh, the remaining time. I want to mention three practices that will help each one of us grow in love. Okay, three practices that, that we can do in our own lives that go, okay, this, this will help me be more loving. This will help me represent Jesus better. This will help me embrace what the Holy Spirit is teaching us about love. Uh, and, and, and the reason I, I talk about love in practice is because love in theory is, that just really means nothing. But love in practice is beautiful. Let me say that again. Love in theory really doesn't matter at all. If you theoretically love me, I don't care. But if you actually love me in practice, in reality, it, ma it, it makes a difference. Right? I, I mean, and, and there's so many people who, who love in theory uh, in the name of Jesus, and, and it doesn't impact the world around us. You see, I was taught to love in theory. I was taught the theory of love. I prefer the practice of love. So here's three practices that I think will help all of us love better. Okay, the first one is... Value yourself as God's child. Value yourself as God's child. Jesus said, the second is like it, love your neighbor as... Yeah, love your neighbor as yourself. If you loathe who you are, if you look in the mirror and despise what you see, um, then you're going to not be able to love very well. In fact, it's going to be impossible for you to love well. Um, so how many, of you, uh, how many of you have children or grandchildren? Okay, a lot of hands. How many of you love your children or your grandchildren? Okay, I think all of you raised your hands. <laughs> so, you know, of course you do. Of course you love your kids. Of course you love your grandkids. Are your children perfect? No. I was waiting for someone to throw it out there. <laughs> Maybe one of their kids sitting next to them right now, you know, it's like, no. Are your grandkids perfect? No, they're not. No, they're not. I'm going to agree with my daughter who says, yes, they're perfect little sinners. Because uh, they are. We're, we're natural born sinners. And yes, you love them even in their imperfections. So here's the reality. God loves you. God loves you in your rebellion, in your defiance, even in your self-destruction. God loves you. And God sent Jesus into this world to save us from our rebellion, to save us from our defiance, to save us from our self-destruction. And that's why he died on the cross to pay for our sins so we didn't have to pay for it because to pay for it means hell. And he took all of that punishment on himself so that we could be redeemed. And you know what? 
This is so cool. To as many as believed in him and, re or, and received him and believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So the end result was when we confess Jesus, God adopts us into his family as his children. That is amazing. And you guys don't care. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's, okay, that's nice. No, I mean, this is like the most amazing thing because he could have just said, I'll, I'll, I'll take you as my slaves. Could have just said, hey, I'll let you work for me. But he said, no, I want you to be my kids. I choose you, I adopt you into my family. So we become children of God and that means that you are God's child. Yeah, see that, now you get it. Hey, hey, do you think God loves his children? Yes. Do you think God loves his child? Yes. Do you think God loves you? Yes. See, that, that's a truth that needs to resonate with us. Because until we can own that, until we can remind ourselves that God loves me, in all of my flaws, in all of my imperfections, in all of my rebellion, in all the stupid things I've done, uh, God still looks at me and he delights in me and he wants me to thrive in life. And God looks at you and he delights in you and he wants you to thrive in life. He, he wants you to thrive. That's why he put his Holy Spirit in you. He didn't just send his Holy Spirit to like, make, you know, visit like angels did, you know, in the Old Testament. No, he moved in. He's like, you're mine and I'm gonna guarantee it by putting my Holy Spirit in you until that day of redemption. And, 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 and while he's there, he's gonna mess your life up really good because he wants you to be blessed. And the way you're gonna be blessed is if you read and apply God's word and you start looking like Jesus in your character. And so he's teaching you these things. I don't know if you noticed this. We looked at this last week, the, the deeds of the flesh. Uh, verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Look, that's destruction right there. That's a list of self-destructive, self-loathing behaviors. And God grieves when we engage in those behaviors because it's bringing pain and sorrow and destruction into our lives. And he wants to lead us into love and joy and peace and all the rest. And so he's calling us to live differently. He's calling us to love differently. I mean, you read that list of deeds of the flesh. Is that the life you want for your kids? No. That's not the life that God wants for his kids either. He wants to bless you because he loves you. Remind yourself of that. Often, remind yourself that God loves you. Value yourself as God's child. Uh, re look, every day, just thank God for loving you in your mess. Because if you remind yourself often of his amazing, abundant, and eternal love for you, not only will it, it just like make your day better, it'll make your life better because you understand that you're valuing yourself as God's child, but then you'll be able to see other people as loved by Jesus. And that's the next practice. See others as people loved by Jesus. So we're, we're gonna love better if we value ourselves as God's child, but then that will enable us to see people differently because Jesus loves you. And guess what? Jesus loves everyone else. You're not his favorite. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I know some of you are a little disappointed. I'm not his favorite either because he loves us. It completely, way beyond what we deserve, way beyond what we can accept, way, way beyond what we can understand. He loves everyone. And, and, and what happens is we become unloving people because we don't see the value in others. We don't see them as being God's desire. We don't see them as being God's creation, as being God's kids. And, and when we don't recognize their status as fellow children of God or people that God wants to adopt, we... we Enable ourselves to treat them with unkindness, with being mean, unloving. Does that make sense? See, when you see somebody and you go, oh, they're my enemy because they vote different than me. They're my enemy because they, they attack people who believe what I believe. They're my enemy because whatever reason you ascribe for that enemy because they want the same job I want or whatever. If, if they're the opposition, you don't see them as being loved by Jesus. But, but when you see them differently, you love them differently. 
And by the way, Jesus saw people. I mean, Jesus saw the widows. He saw the sick, the lame, the blind, the hurting. He allowed people to interrupt him. He embraced disruptions in his life as ministry opportunities. Read the Gospels. People were always annoying Jesus. Right? The children were coming to him, and the disciples were like, get these filthy kids out of here. And Jesus was like, let the kids come to me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. There's blind guys calling out on the side of the road, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Crowds telling him, shut up and leave Jesus alone. They just yell louder. <laughs> Jesus stops and goes, bring them over here. And heals them. I mean, you just, you read it. it. There's interruptions all the time. And Jesus saw people. And if we want to love like Jesus, then we have to see people and recognize them that they are like us. They're in need of the love of God. The people that we run into, they're struggling. I mean, they're hurting, they're sick, they're grieving. Just like us. You know, that car that's on your tail and is driving really fast, don't get mad at them. Maybe they're trying to get to the hospital because they want to say goodbye to their loved one. That car driving really slow in front of you that you're annoyed at, maybe they're just in a fog because they just lost their spouse of 50 years. You don't know. But we ascribe all the, you know, we, we just see them as objects, like, get out of my way. You know, that, that, uh, that waitress that didn't get your order just right, maybe she was just served with divorce papers. Or maybe her child is being bullied at school. Or that your child's teacher that you're really angry at right now, maybe they just got diagnosed with cancer. You see, we don't know what people are struggling with, but we inhabit a sin-broken world where everyone is struggling. Everyone is hurting. Everyone is broken. Everyone is damaged by sin. We just don't know what they're struggling with. But if we want to practice love, we have to see people through Jesus' eyes. You go, hey, wow, you know what? This is, this is somebody that is a child of God or somebody that God wants to become a child of God. There are only two categories, right? Either you're a child of God or you need to be a child of God. You're a child of God or God wants to adopt you. That's how this works. And we're on mission to recruit the adoptees. That's what we're doing. Can't do it unless we love. We can't love unless we see people, see others as people loved by Jesus. And then third, the third practice that will revolutionize your love life is bless people whenever you can. Bless people whenever you can. Um, God has given each one of us tremendous power. The power to bless and the power to curse. Okay, you read the Old Testament and blessings were a big deal. We don't understand the power uh, that, you know, Jacob had or that, the, you know, Isaac had and, and all the stories and the power of blessing. are like, oh, bless me, bless me, bless me. They, they want to be blessed. People still want to be blessed. And if we are representing Jesus, if we love people, you know what we're going to do? We're going to bless people. We are. I mean, love your neighbor as yourself. That's Jesus. Jesus also said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Wow, that says a lot. Paul says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. So to love is to bless. So bless people. We're like, okay, we're going to bless people. What does that look like? What does that look like? It, hey, look, you can bless people with a smile. You can bless people by saying thank you. You can bless people just by giving them words of encouragement. You know, I mean, those are just simple blessings. You can bless people by serving them, by helping them, by being generous, by sharing knowledge. Look, there's so many ways you can bless people. It, by the way, it is your superpower. You may not realize it. You may have not have tapped into it at all, but it is your superpower. The world changes when you start going, hey, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna bless people and they can't stop me. <laughs> blessings are indefensible. They don't have to receive them, but they can't stop you from blessing them. And what happens is if you try to bless someone and they're like, no, then all these other people are around like, you're an idiot. <laughs> hey, come over here and bless me. It's, it's all good. No, I mean, look, it's your superpower. And besides, here's the, here's, the, here's the selfish angle, if you're looking for the selfish angle. Because some of you are. So I, I, how does this really work? Well, let me tell you the selfish angle. The Bible says repeatedly, you reap what you sow. Yeah, so if you bless people, what are you going to get? <laughs> yeah, it's like... This is kind of a win. Here's the thing. If you, this is what happens. If you just try to bless yourself, guess what you get? Nothing. 
In fact, God's going to be like, I ain't giving you nothing because you're a selfish brat. Why don't you bless some people? So I'll, I'll pile on some blessings on top of you as well. So, I mean, it just makes sense. So bless strangers. You know, the, the, the waiter or waitress that's taking care of you, the law enforcement that wants to have a conversation with you on the side of the road. <laughs> you know when they pull us over, we usually deserve it. So you might as well just go ahead and, and bless them. Uh, the medical staff that's taking care of you, even the people at the DMV, come on, look. They, you you got to see them as people loved by Jesus too, all right? Uh, bless your friends. Usually that's the easy part, right? I like my friends because they're my friends, so bless them. But most importantly, bless your family. Bless your family. It should be the most natural place to bless, but we often mess this up. I'm just gonna tell you, you want a happier spouse? Bless your, bless your spouse. It'll bless your marriage. If you want your marriage to be better, just go, okay, I'm gonna bless my spouse. I'm, not, I'm gonna stop nagging. I'm gonna stop begging. I'm gonna stop manipulating. I'm gonna stop controlling. I'm gonna stop the silent treatment. I'm just gonna bless. I'm just telling you right now, you will be amazed at the change in your marriage. Now, if you do this like on a real like hard repentance, like you go home tonight and you're like, I'm gonna bless from now on, you, you know, your spouse may go, who possessed you? In which case you go, the Holy Spirit. And I'm learning a lesson I should have learned a long time ago. So repent publicly, it's good. And, and parents, bless your kids. Parents set the tone for families. I don't, I don't know if you realize this, parents, but you decide what the tone of your family is gonna be. Is it gonna be happy? Is it gonna be angry? Is it gonna be serious or is it gonna be joyful? I mean, you, you set the tone for your family. It's not your kid's fault, it's your fault. I'm just gonna tell you, mom and dad, you have the power. And, and so like, I grew up in a family where it, it was all angry work. I mean, it was angry work. There wasn't a lot of laughter, there wasn't a lot of joy. It was just work and anger. And those were the, you know, anger was the only emotion we were allowed to show. And, and so that's what I grew up in. I'm still living in the rebellion against that. Have you guys noticed? So. Um, that, that's, that's not my vibe. That's not how I want to do. I got in trouble for having fun all my life. So you decide the tone. It was so cool though. My parents repented as I got older. They learned how to play. They learned how to relax. They had friends and enjoy. And they, the grandkids changed everything, of course. So, and, and older parents, if you didn't do this well when your kids were at home, it's not too late. Okay, it's not too late. Call them, text them, you know, email them, do whatever you can to communicate and apologize for the curses and bless them. Remind them that you love them. Tell them how you're proud of them. You're like, I don't know if I could do that. Well, here's a story from about uh, six weeks ago. I, I got the privilege of teaching at the state men's retreat up at uh, Williams, snowed on us, late April. And, uh, and, and I was wrapping up a Saturday night session and I was talking about families and I was talking about blessing your kids and challenged them to do exactly what I'm telling you. Call, text, write, tell them you love them, tell them you're proud of them. And Sunday morning, this older guy, older than me, so you know, you go, older guy, you are an older guy. No, older than me. So he had kids like in his 40s or 50s now and he comes up to me, he's so excited. He said, Pastor, I did what you said last night. I, I texted my son and here's his response. And he gave me his phone to read his response. He couldn't even just tell me. And, and he had said, I, his son gratefully received an apology and a blessing. And his son said, Dad, that's the first time you've ever told me that you're proud of me. And the second time you've ever told me that you love me. His son was in his, at least in his 40s. And I just looked at the man and I said, praise God, don't let that be the last. Don't let that be the last. You don't know what God can do if you just simply bless. And God has given us the power to bless. And he's called us to use that power for his kingdom. Because if you wanna be loving people, then let's practice blessing whenever we can and watch how God works miracles through that. So let's stop talking about love like it's a theory. And let's practice love. Because love in action is beautiful, and it's way more powerful than love in theory. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. So many times we don't feel lovely. We don't feel worthy of your love. And we actually, we're not worthy of your love, but you choose to love us anyway. And you've poured out mercy and grace on us abundantly. And we thank you for that. 
But God, as your children, we want to reflect your values more than our values. We want to reflect your character more than our character. So God, our, our request is that you would teach us how to love, how to bless, how to see people differently, and how to accept your love into our lives. So God, at whatever point in that journey, we need your help. We just surrender and we submit and we ask that your Holy Spirit would take your word and apply it to our lives so that we can be people who love like Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Pastor Chad presented what love looks like in practice. It starts with valuing yourself as God's child, seeing others as people loved by Jesus, and blessing people whenever you can. Are you representing Jesus in the way that you love? If you'd like to learn more about Calvary, I invite you to visit our website, calvaryaz.com. There, you'll find information about upcoming events. You can follow us on our social media platforms, view or listen to past messages, and give to support us financially. Thanks for listening. Join us next weekend when we look at another fruit of the Spirit, joy. Have a great week. Bye-bye.